start over here. Today we have two Bible verses. I'm not going to read them. We're going to say them together. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Today's candle on the Advent wreath is, as we said, the candle of love. God's love for us that he demonstrated in Jesus Christ. Love is uh, it's a... It's, it's something that's often talked about, but seldom given very much thought, real deep thought. B.J. Thomas, I think, is the one who said, uh, love is just a word in a song that's been way overused. Any of you remember B.J. Thomas? The word love has uh, pretty much lost a lot of its meaning in our culture today. We use it in a variety of different ways, so much so that its true meaning is watered down almost completely to the point of losing it. We love pizza. We love hamburgers. Coach loves golf. We love baseball. We love football. We love our car. We love our house. We love our refrigerator even today. Some people love Wheel of Fortune, others like Gilligan's Island. We love the movies, we love shopping or woodworking, we love the beach and the hot sunshine, or we love the mountains and the cool breeze. We love the rain, and there are some very strange people who love the snow. We love it all. So even though we use love for nearly everything we can think of, when we say this one word to another person, it takes on a different significance. How much significance the word of love takes on uh, when we mention it to a person is dependent upon our relationship with them. I mean, telling a friend that you love them is different from telling your fiancé or your spouse that you love them. At least it should be. But even in relationships, the word love is really not understood and has lost a lot of meaning. When I do premarital counseling... One of the first questions I asked the couple before me on the very first session of our counseling is this. When you turn to your fiancé and you say, I love you, what do you mean? What do you mean? I love you. Now, quite frankly, most of them have no idea what they mean. And many of them try to come up with some, some answers of what they mean. I've, I've heard some really good ones we could write a good book on. It would be funny, but it, it, you know, it, it, it would be uh, try, trub, quite troubling also. It's just what you're supposed to say to someone you're getting ready to marry. I love you. Some of the most popular answers are, I like being with you. I like being with you. I love you. You make me laugh. <laughs> I love you. You make me feel good. How many of you are married or have been married this morning? Some of you have been married a long time, I know. Uh, I would just say this. I think I'm in an expert of people who've been married. Do you always feel like being with your spouse? No. I mean, always. Holly, you don't have to be the first to answer. <laughs> Does your spouse always make you laugh? 
Does your spouse always make you feel good? I, I believe we would all agree the answer to all of those questions is no. So when, when a person is defining I love you as you make me laugh or you make me feel good or I like being with you, well, what is it they feel when they are not in those particular situations? If they don't make you laugh, if you don't feel good about them, if you don't particularly want to be with them this day, you'd rather be anywhere else. There are those times when those that we love don't make us laugh and they don't make us feel good and we really don't want to be around them, but we still love them. If those definitions are what love is, I don't know of anyone who've experienced love. One thing we all need to know is this. Love is not primarily a feeling. Okay? Love is not primarily a feeling. Yes, feelings are associated with love, but the foundation of love is not something that you feel towards somebody. Yes, marital love may begin with attraction and feelings of love. At least that's what Holly told me, that she was attracted to me. <laughs> marital love may begin with that attraction and that feeling, but listen, folks. If all you have in your marriage is attraction and feelings, guess what happens when the attractiveness disappears? <laughs> because it does disappear. And the feelings change. I think they change for the better, but they change. If you're expecting to have the same feelings you've always had when you first got married, you're in for an eye awakening. True, genuine love has a foundation that is stronger than any physical attraction or any feeling. Unfortunately, most love today is primarily how you make me feel. And when those feelings change or the attraction is gone, have you ever heard anyone say, I've fallen out of love? We just don't love each other anymore. I want to tell you, when you hear those words, you know they had the wrong concept of love. Wrong concept of love. Now, if we're having trouble with this concept that love isn't primarily a feeling, then look at God's love for us. Just look at it. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do we really want God's love to be based on how we make him feel? I certainly hope not, because I know there are days I'd begin hell. Do we really want his love for us to be based on whether our actions make him feel good about us? I don't think so. But fortunately, God doesn't love us based on feelings or attraction. As we said, God demonstrated his love for us while we were still sinners. Many translations say enemies of him. Jesus died for us when we were still not making God feel very good. He was sad. Jesus' death was not based on his feelings for us. A foundational principle in Scripture, if you study it through, is that love is nothing if it is not displayed. Love is nothing if it is not demonstrated. God's love for us is demonstrated by Jesus dying for us. Jesus coming to earth. Pleasing, the Lord, pleasing his Father perfectly and then dying on the cross for us. We can't say that we love someone if we never show them that love in things that we do. 
Men, you can tell your wife you love them all the time, but until you get up off the couch and do something, you haven't said anything. Just to sit at home and not bother our neighbor is not loving our neighbor. Love is expressive. Love takes the initiative. It is not passive. I cannot say that I love someone just because I feel you're okay today. No. That's not what love is. In fact, my love for you has very little to do with you. It has more to do with me. If God demonstrated his love for us by Jesus dying, then what was his love if it was not a feeling? God's love for us is his undying, unwavering commitment to us. So in that counseling session with that couple that's getting ready to be married, I will say to them, you failed. You failed. When I turn to my wife and I say, I love you, I mean, I don't care if a car accident takes your attractiveness away. I don't care if you gain 300 pounds. I don't care if you can't speak or you can't walk. I don't care. I personally am committed to you regardless of who you are or what happens to you. I am committed to you. And that is what Jesus Christ did. That is what God did for us. From the very point where Adam and Eve sinned, he was committed to us. And it had nothing to do with ushy gushy feelings. He created us. We sinned. He committed himself to redeem us. 1 John 4. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. We learned from childhood on that God is love. Every bit of love comes from God. There is no Love outside of God. God's example of love is his son Jesus Christ dying for him. And through that example, we learn that love really is a commitment of putting others first. Can you imagine that? The creator of the universe, the creator of all things, the source of everything good, committed himself to doing what was best for us, not himself. That is love. It has nothing to do with feelings, for why would Jesus tell us, love your enemies, if it had anything to do with feelings? Because we don't really feel good about our enemies, do we? But love isn't a feeling. Love is a commitment to put that person first. A commitment to do what's best in, for them and not for you. We can do that regardless of how we feel about them. That's what, exactly what God did for us. He committed himself to mankind. He thought more of his creation than he did himself, even though his creation had turned their back on him. Yet he was willing to literally become one of us and die for us. Jesus becoming a man born of the Virgin Mary was God demonstrating his love for us, a commitment that he had toward us from before creation. And God's love through Jesus is the ultimate example of love, the ultimate, the ultimate example of deliberately putting others before yourself or thinking more about others than you do yourself. Love 
true love, listen, love, true love, does not have to be a two-way street. We can and we are even commanded to love those who do not love us. That's exactly what God did for us. The question isn't, does God love us? He's already demonstrated that for us. He can't show us in any clearer way that he loves us. The baby in the manger is just the beginning of God demonstrating his love for us. The real question is, do we love God? And that doesn't mean, do I have this ushy gushy feeling about God? It means, am I willing to be committed to him in such a way that it is expressed, demonstrated in my life that I am willing to die to myself for his benefit? That is love for God. I, for one, <laughs> I, I can't be any more happy or more ecstatic that God's love for me is not based on how he feels about me. I... I, I I have nothing for God to feel good about. His love for me is his commitment to me. And that commitment was demonstrated when I was still his enemy. Listen to 2 Corinthians 5. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God reconciled himself to us through Christ. In plain language, that means that this baby born in a manger throughout his lifetime did everything that was necessary for God to hold nothing against us. He reconciled himself to us. And Paul's exhortation is be reconciled to God. Receive what God has done for you. Receive his love and in turn be committed to him as he is committed to you. It's possible to love someone who does not love you, but it is impossible to be in a relationship with someone who does not love you. God loves us. Will we love him? so we can be in relationship with him. Many times people enter marriage thinking, I am so glad my spouse is going to meet all my needs. And they're both entering the marriage that way. And neither one of them are saying, I am so looking forward to meeting my spouse's needs. It's two ticks and no dog. <laughs> but when you're in a relationship where your, your needs are not what you think about, but you only think about your spouse's needs, so I only think about Holly's needs and how I can fulfill those needs for her. She only thinks about my needs and how I, or how she can, can, can fulfill them for me. We're both getting our needs met, but nobody's thinking of themselves. I'm going to tell you, that's exactly the way serving the Lord is all about. God is all about meeting our needs. And he doesn't care about his. Quite frankly, he doesn't really have any needs other than he desires for us to love him. But when we think about God and what, what he wants us to give for him that meets his needs, we win. Our God, almighty God, the creator, sustainer, sovereign ruler of all the world can meet every need and desire that we have. There is nothing he can't do. How can we dare think that to be committed to him, we have to give up something 
Oh my goodness gracious. We're gaining the world. We're gaining a relationship with the eternal one for eternity. Our only appropriate response to God demonstrating his love for us through this baby born, through this baby growing up, through this baby living and dying, defeating death for us, the only response that is fitting is to commit ourselves to him, to love him, to put his will before our own. The hymn says, child for us sinners, poor and in the manger, we would embrace thee with love and awe. Who would not love thee, loving us so dearly? Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord.